Good evening to everyone. Welcome back. Praise the Lord. I hope you've had a wonderful week and a blessed weekend. And you are now ready to just sit at the feet of Jesus and learn of him. Um, as we wait for others to log in, we're just going to open the session with a word of prayer. Can we just bow our heads as we invite the Holy Spirit, who is our teacher, to join with us? Thank you, Lord. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you for the Holy Spirit, who is our teacher. We invite him now to come and join with us and teach us your word. We ask, Lord, that you grant us a hearing ear, an understanding mind, and a willing heart. And Father, we just pray for openness, Lord, that we are open to the Spirit of God. In the mighty name of Jesus, we bring every person who is going to tune in tonight, even those that will tune in later to listen. We just pray that the Holy Ghost will move upon their hearts. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Uh, good evening once again to everybody. Welcome back. Welcome back. I hope you've had a, a fruitful week and a blessed weekend. And you are ready now to hear the word. Tonight we are looking at the fear, the fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord. I'm sure most of us, when you talk the word fear, we can identify with what we are seeing around us these days. I just been to the supermarket this afternoon just to pick up a few things and it's amazing how empty the shelves are and how people are panicking. They are buying everything they can buy. The shops are empty. The business people are the ones that are making the money. But we are afraid. We are afraid of coronavirus, which we cannot see with our eyes. We don't know where it is. We don't know where it's going to come from. And fear is gripping the hearts of people. People are frightened. People are scared because you don't know who's got it. It could be someone sitting next to you on the train. It could be the very same person serving you in the shop, you know, from what they are saying, the things that we are buying in the shops, someone with coronavirus may have been touching it and put it back and you, t you buy it, you take it home. So what do we do? Where do we run? We are so afraid. <clears throat> Let's go to Isaiah. You know, every time that we are overwhelmed, every time we are being overwhelmed by situations and circumstances as children of god we need to go back to the word to find answers we need to go back to the word to find solutions so turn to isaiah 8 isaiah chapter 8 i'll read this 12 and welcome to those who just joining us isaiah 8 this 12 say ye not a confederacy to all them to whom this people shall say a confederacy. Neither fear ye their fear, nor be afraid. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself, and let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. What is the scripture saying here? God is saying to his people, to his children, do not fear what the world fears. Do not be afraid of the fear of the world, but your fear must be the Lord God Almighty. He must be your fear. He must be your dread. Not coronavirus, not any other pandemic that is coming from out there. Our fear must be the fear of the Lord. And now, First Peter chapter 3, First Peter chapter 3, I will read verse 13 to 14. First Peter chapter 3, verse 13 to verse 14. And who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? Who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? 
But if ye suffer for righteousness sake, happy are ye and be not afraid of their terror. Be not afraid of their terror. Neither be ye troubled. Neither be ye troubled. I believe we have come to such a time where we need to stand on the word of God. The Bible said in the last days the just shall live by their faith. It's time that when you begin to say the Lord is my shepherd, I shall fear not. You mean it and you believe it. You believe that though, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall not be afraid. You have to believe the word. You have to stand on the word. It's not time to be quoting it, to be playing games with it. It's time to walk in it. It's time to believe in it because Believe you me, we don't know where the virus is. We don't know who's got it. We don't know when we are going to come into contact with it. But we know one thing for sure. The Lord says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. The Lord says, though you walk through the valley, I will be with you. God is saying, I will not allow anything to happen to you. He is saying, fear not what they fear. Do not be afraid, but let your fear be the fear of God. Let your fear be the fear of God. So we want to talk about that fear of God tonight. We want to talk about the fear of God. Proverbs 9 verse 10. Let's go to Proverbs 9 verse 10. I'm reading New International Version. It says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do you want wisdom? Wisdom is not running. Wisdom is not running in fear. Wisdom is not running in fear to hold food in your house. Because that same food, like I say, you don't know who's been handling it in the supermarket. That same food might carry coronavirus to your couples in your house and you are eating it. You don't know that. But what we know is when we bless the food, it is blessed of God. It is sanctified. What we know is the Bible says, even if we are beaten by the serpents, they will not kill us because God will fight for us. We as children of God, we do not walk by fear, but we walk by faith. We believe that God is able. We believe that none of the judgments that come upon the world will come upon us because he promised like he promised Israel. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. I do believe that even today, those people that know their God, they have the seal of God upon them. When this virus passes by, it will pass over the children of God. Just like the angel of death in the times of, of, in the times of Egypt, it passed over every house where the blood was applied. Even coronavirus will pass over every believer, every child of God will not be killed by it. It will pass over as long as you believe that greater is he that is in you than the coronavirus that is out there. Hallelujah. But what is wisdom? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. What is wisdom? You know, I'm amazed at young Solomon when God comes to Solomon and says, Solomon, you have your chance now. Ask anything that you desire and I will give to you. In his position, he could have asked that God give me power to overcome all the nations around me. Kill all my enemies. That's what most Christians spend their night time praying. Keep death to my enemies. No, Solomon said, God, I need wisdom. I need wisdom because he understood that with wisdom, you have everything that you need to live this life. So the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. 
when you know the Holy One, you have understanding. What understanding? You have understanding of where go, what God is doing, what the Word of God means, what it is saying, what it means to you. So let's look at what wisdom is. Wisdom is to depart from evil. Wisdom is to depart from evil. When you begin to hate sin, you hate pride, you hate arrogance, you hate evil, evil behavior, you hate perverse speech, and you are saying to yourself, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to sit in the seat of the ungodly. That's what Psalms were saying. Blessed is he who does not sit in the seat of the scornful nor stand in the, in the pathway of sinners. That's wisdom. That is a wise person. So the Bible tells us that wisdom is greater than rubies. That means money. That's why Solomon did not ask God for money. He asked God for wisdom because wisdom will get him money anyway. But money will not get you wisdom. Wisdom will get you lots of money, but money will never get you wisdom. There is a lot of rich people who are still fools who lack wisdom. That's why they do not know God, because they lack wisdom. So Solomon asked for wisdom. He did not ask for money. So wisdom is knowledge. It is discernment. It is power. It is sound judgment, understanding and discretion. We need sound judgment we need discretion we need understanding even understanding of the times that we are living in understanding of the hour that we are in today some of us are like the world we talk like the world we we we, we panic like the world we run like the world we are full of fear like the world we are so afraid to die because we don't know where we are going i want to tell you you know when paul said for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. He says, you know, I consider whether to die or to, to live. And I'm only living because I need to preach the gospel. It, if it wasn't because I need to preach the gospel, I'll choose to, to go. I'll choose to be with the Father. So death is only an open door to enter into eternity. We should not be afraid of dying as Christians. We should not fear death. We should know that when death comes, it's time to go home to be with the Father. It's time to be in, in heaven. It's time for that very thing that you have believed God for, you have waited for all your life. So wisdom, wisdom is to listen to the word of God. A wise person will do what the word of God tells him. They say in the world, a word to the wise is sufficient. What do you think they mean? A word to a wise person is sufficient. You don't need to say a whole sentence, just one word. The wise person will pick it up immediately. Because why? A wise person has understanding. They can discern. They understand things. They discern and they understand. You know, we see that over the years, over the generations that have come and gone, the enemy has been very, very busy deceiving the church he has been very very busy slowly but surely substituting the truths of the word of god for a lie he has not removed the word he has just changed the interpretation of the word i hope you get what i'm saying the devil does not remove the bible the occultic people, they are still holding the same Bible like what you are holding. It's the way they interpret it. They have changed the interpretation of what the word of God means. The same way that the serpent in the time of Eve said to Eve, did God really say that? In other words, I think you misunderstood God. That's not what God meant. Let me expound. Let me explain to you. That's how we are being deceived today to move away from the fear of God because the word has been watered down. The devil has fed us with his interpretation of the word of God. And many of us run with that interpretation of a wishy-washy God who is 
reason, anytime, anywhere, anything, God. But that's not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible, the Bible says, fear the Lord. Let him be your dread. Fear God. For the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The reason why we are where we are as Christians is because we lost the fear of God. We lost the fear of God. We have a God of our own understanding, a God our, of our own making. Our Pharisees, you know, in the time of Jesus, the Pharisees were doing the same. They were interpreting the, 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 the scriptures according to their own way. The Pharisees of our generation are doing exactly the same thing. The only difference is that they are getting away with it because we are a generation that refuses to read the Bible. We are a generation that refuses to pray. And because we do not read our Bibles and because we do not pray, we have no clue what the Word of God says. We are dependent on those who claim to read it to tell us what it says. We are just like the people of the time of Jesus except that they were not reading because they were uneducated. They could not read. So they depended on the Pharisees to explain the scriptures to them. But we are educated in our generation. You must not depend on someone else telling you what the Bible says. You must read for yourself. Learn to get into the scriptures. Learn to read. You know, the fear of God is basically the foundation to all true wisdom. The fear of God is the foundation to all true wisdom. You cannot say you got godly wisdom when you do not have the fear of God in your life. The fear of God is what protects us from error. The fear of God is protecting us from being false prophets because we are so afraid to prophesy lies in the name of the Lord. We are so afraid to say, to preach lies in the name of the Lord because we know there is accountability. We know that we are going to give, uh, uh, we are going to be accountable before God for every word that comes out of our mouth. But the fool that has no fear of God doesn't consider those things. They do whatever they want and they use the name of the Lord just like that with no concern, no worry. So the fear of the Lord is foundational to true wisdom for all other type of learning is worthless unless it is built upon the knowledge of the Lord himself. Anything else that is not built upon the true knowledge of who God is, it is a waste of time. Thus is say the people that know their God, they shall do exploits for him. It's the people that know their God. I'm telling you, church, I believe in my heart of hearts we are in the end times. And I believe in my heart of heart. God is separating the sheep from the goats. I believe in my heart of us that now is the time that Jesus is, the Holy Ghost is preparing the bride of Jesus Christ. He is coming into the body of Christ. He is dividing the true worshippers from the false worshippers. You are going to begin to see the church being split into two. You are going to see the dividing line of God in every church. There will be the true church one side. There will be the false church on the the other side because the false church is going to try to change the word of God, substitute the word of God with the will of men. When the true church is going to stand its ground and say, no, we are not going to substitute the word for the desires of mankind. The word of God is the same today, yesterday and forever. And the word of God will never change. Jesus said, my word will stand here. Heaven and earth will pass away, but the word of God will never pass away. We are in that time. We are in that time that we who claim to be the true church are going to have to stand for the truth. 
We are going to have to stand for the truth. We are going to have to say, that's what the word of God is saying. And that's what we stand upon. That's what we believe. And we refuse every other lie of the enemy. And you are going to have to stand. Even if they cut off your, your neck, you are going to have to stand. Even if they throw you in prison, you are going to have to make that strand sooner or later. Believe me, it is coming. It is coming. It is coming. It is coming. Now, let us look at what the Bible means by fear. We keep saying the fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord. What is fear in the context of the Bible? What is fear in the context of the Bible? The Bible, what, how does the Bible translate fear? The Bible translates fear in several ways. In I'm not going to read all the scriptures, but I hope you got your pen and paper. Take the scriptures down, read them in your own spare time. In Deuteronomy 2 verse 25, you know, it refers to the terror that people feel in a frightening situation. When something happens, you have that terror. You, right now, people have terror for coronavirus the kind of terror they do not have of God. And yet God is the one that's created everything. And yet God holds your life in the palm of his hand. He gave it to you and he can take it away anytime he decides to take it away. Long before coronavirus can take you, God can in an instant take away your breath from you and you can drop dead where you are sitting. Yet we do not have that fear of God in our lives. It can also mean respect. Respect in the way that a servant respects his master and serves him faithfully. You know, servants fear their master. It's not the, the dreaded fear of the master is going to hit me, the master is going to kill me, but it's that respect, reverence, fear of the master, and they serve the master well because they respect and they honor the master. That's what that fear means. That's what it means. The reverence, the awe that you have for someone who's greater than yourself so do we have the fear of god do we understand that god holds our lives in the palm of his hand do we understand that everything we have comes from him do you understand that you are not where you are because you were clever you are where you are because god predestined you for that position for that place it is a god-given thing and god can take it away as quickly as he has given you Saul never thought he could ever be king but god put him there and god says to Saul, when you were little in your eyes did i not make you king over my people but when you became too big for your own boots I rejected you as king and I put someone else in your place. You see, God can lift you up and God can bring you down. He has the power. So should we not fear the God of heaven who has the power to lift you and the power to bring you down? He has the power to give you breath and the power to take it away. That's the other scripture, Joshua 24 verse 14 Please read these scriptures when you are by yourself at home. So all these things that I'm speaking of, they combine together to give us the fear of the Lord. That means the reverence, the obedience. We, rever we reverence God. We obey God out of what? Respect, genuine respect for who he is. Genuine fear that he is such a great God. He is such a, an awesome God, the creator of all things. You know, we give him his place. We give him his place. We respect him. Our children fear us. When you say to your child, don't do that, they know that if they do, they are in trouble. And sometimes well-trained children, you just give them the eye in front of people just look at them in the corner of your eye they sit down and behave because they fear the parent we need to fear god we need to walk in the fear of god in exactly the same way we need to walk in the fear of god remember proverbs 14 verse 12 proverbs 14 verse 12 says 
There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. That is why fools despise wisdom. Fools refuse to honor God. Fools refuse to believe. There is someone who created the heavens and the earth. Fools refuse to acknowledge that God exists. They refuse. They want to have their own way which looks right in their own eyes that the end of that way is death. The end of that way is death. When I die, I know where I'm going. I know when I die to you, I appear in the presence of my Father in heaven. I never die. I live on. But when an unbeliever die, that is the end. That is the end. They are going to a place that you wouldn't wish your enemy to go. So we need to understand. We need the fear, the fear of God, the fear of God. For too long we have been deceived as believers by the serpent who is still using the same trick he used on Adam and Eve. Did God really say, did God really say be holy? Nobody can be holy. So these holy preachers, you know, they, they, they are under the law. They are keeping you under the law. They are putting a heavy yoke on you. Well, it's not under the law. In the book of Peter, Peter says, be holy for I am holy. That is God saying in first Peter, be holy for I am holy. Holiness is what God demands. And those who fear the Lord, they will depart from evil. They will depart from evil conversations. They will depart from sinful lifestyles. They will depart from all things that God hates. For God has listed the things in black and white. He says, I hate a lying tongue. I hate a person who causes disunity. I hate a pride. God has listed it all. And a wise person will do well to stay away from those things which God hates because they fear the Lord. They fear the Lord. The fear of the Lord is lacking in the body of Christ today. We do so many things in the name of the Lord because we do not know him. He says, they always err for they have not known my ways. They always err for they have not known my ways. We substitute our will for God's will. We put aside God's will and we put our will. We put aside God's ways and we put our ways and we say that's the will of God but that is the will of man. Those are the ways of man. For God says my ways are not your ways. As high as the heaven is above the earth are my ways higher than your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts as high as the heaven is above the earth. God's thoughts are much higher than our thoughts. But we try to bring God down to the level of man because we do not have the fear of God. We do not have the fear of God. So wisdom is merely just seeing life from God's perspective. That's what wisdom is. When you are able to see life from God's perspective, or like we say, through the eyes of the Holy Spirit, then wisdom has come into your life. When you can see things through the eyes of the Holy Spirit and you respond accordingly, that means we are always what seeking the things that are pleasing to God. We are always seeking the things that are above and not the things that are here on the earth. You know, the book of Proverbs is known as the book of wisdom. It has so much, so much wisdom in it. It explains the value of gaining wisdom in all your gaining. Gain wisdom, gain wisdom, gain wisdom. We need wisdom in our generation. How many people have pierced their hearts with so many sorrows because they made decisions that lacked wisdom and they had to pay 
pay severely for those decisions because we lack wisdom, because we have not asked God, because we do not seek the will of God. We do not pray and ask God. But you know, a wise man, a wise man will always seek the will of God. Take David and Saul. Saul was a flesh man, never ever consulted God. And the one time he tried to do it, he did it the wrong way and got himself rejected totally. Whereas David never did anything without consulting God. Even when one day he comes from battle and he finds his house destroyed, his children all the people taken away by the enemy, the army, the soldiers are saying, David, let's go for it. Let's run, David. Let's run. David says, no, let's wait. We need to ask God. They put him under pressure. No, no, they are getting away. We need to follow, pursue now. David says, no, no, no. Be still, be quiet, be still and know there is a God. Ask God, talk to God. And David took that time, talked to God and should I pursue, Lord? What is your will, Lord? And God says, pursue, overtake and take back what belongs to you. He goes out full of confidence, not confidence in his flesh, not confidence in his army, but confidence in the rhema word that God gave him. Pursue, overtake and overcome is confident but many of us because we have not known God, because we do not understand the fear of God. We make decisions for our lives that are not right, and we end up in very sticky places, and then we start crying to God. Oh God, where are you? Oh God, why did you let this happen to me? Oh God, why didn't you protect me? God says, I would have, if you had listened to me, I would have told you not to go there. If you had listened to me, I would have told you not to marry that one. If you had listened to me, I would have told you don't take that job. If you had listened to me, I would have told you don't invest in that thing. It's going to crumble tomorrow. But you never asked me. You went ahead. You did it in your own way. You did it your own way. And that's what happens. That's what happens. You know, a wise man will see and know and evaluate the choices which they make. Because the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. When you are afraid to step out of the will of God, when you are afraid to be outside of God's permission, you will never go into error. You will never make mistakes because you are waiting on God. You are asking God. You are waiting on God to tell you, to show you where to go. Proverbs 1 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Who is the fool? The one who runs and does their own thing without asking for instruction, without asking for direction, without seeking God. You just go and do your own thing. That's what a fool is. A wise man will never take a step without asking God because there could be a landmine right in front of you. One step and you walk into a landmine. But God will always make you go the other way around because God sees the future. He knows everything. We must learn to depend on him and not depend on our friends and not depend on our wisdom and not depend on ourselves. But let us learn to depend on God, understanding that he cares for us. He has good plans for us, good thoughts for us, to give us a hope, to give us an expected ending. He is your father. He wants the best for you. He doesn't want to take away your joy. He doesn't want to take away your happiness. He just wants you to have ha the right kind of joy, the right kind of happiness that will last forever and forever. Not one that you'll be happy today and crying tomorrow. That's what happens to people. They are happy today, happy on the wedding day, happy maybe for one day of the honeymoon. The rest of the years is tears, is tears and sorrow because we never got God, God involved in what we are doing. 
In these end times, it is important to check our beliefs. Are they lining up with the word of God? Or have we interpreted the word to suit ourselves? Check your beliefs. Are they lining up with the word of God or have you interpreted the word of God to suit yourself? That's what Eve did. And she even went as far as saying the fruit look good for food. It looked good to be eaten. And that's what we do. Everything we do looks good until afterwards when you have done it and then you see your own nakedness, your own foolishness then you start hiding because you realize things haven't worked the way you thought they were going to work. Instead of being like God, now they were hiding behind trees in shame. Matthew 24 verse 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Heaven and earth will pass away, but the word of God remains standing until eternity, until he returns. The word that God has spoken will never pass away. The word that God has spoken is never going to change. It's the same today, yesterday, and forever. The word of God will never change. It is the same word Paul and Silas preached. It is the same word Abraham believed. It is the same word Peter preached. It's the same word we are preaching today. It has not changed. The interpretation of the word has not changed. But it's us who have chosen to believe a lie because it's so much easy to believe a lie. Let me give an explanation of one of the major lies we have believed that this lie has made us lose the fear of God is that God is love it's not you know the devil doesn't tell 100% lies he mixes he mixes the truth and the lie God is love but then the devil will take it further and say, God is love. He will never punish anybody. He's never going to throw anyone in the lake of fire because he's too loving. He's too kind. He's this and this. But one thing that the Bible is very clear on is that we are living under the period of mercy and grace because of the finished work of Calvary. But the Bible is clear that the times of the Gentiles will come to an end. When the times of the Gentiles come to an end, the door of mercy will shut down and God will arise from the mercy seat and he will put the mercy garments away and he will put his robe of a judge and he will sit on the judgment throne and as a judge he will judge according to the word with no mercy i'm sure you've been to court before you have seen a judge you know how the judge will pass judgment and say this is what the law demands for this crime the law says we give this punishment there is no mercy is what you deserve you get what you deserve so let us not allow the serpent to fool us like it fooled Adam and Eve and tell us that God is love he is not going to do anything that is abusing the spirit of grace the time of mercy is limited you you know, it scares me when I see a lot of Jewish people turning to Christ because the Bible is clear. When the time for the Gentiles is full, then God will shut the door and he will reopen the door for the Jewish people to come into the faith. Then the Jews are going to begin to come into the faith in crowds. They will begin to believe on whom that they denied. They are going to believe on Yeshua that he was the Messiah that they denied. And I'm telling you people, time is running out. The Bible says there will be a time when the trumpet shall sound and it shall be said let him who is holy remain holy still and let him who is unclean remain unclean still what does that mean it means that the time will be up if it's 12 o'clock the clock strikes 12 the door shuts down 
Somebody says, it's not going to happen. Well, it did happen in the time of Noah. 120 years Noah preached and no one believed. They thought it would never happen. They'd never seen flood. They'd never seen rain. And they said, Noah is just an old man. Where is this water going to come from? Where is this rain? It's never rain. But the time came and it began to rain after God had shut the door. When the, the rains come, the people were now running. They were running. Noah, Noah, open the door. Open the door. We now believe. We can see. But Noah had no more power. He couldn't open the door because God himself had shut the door. People, I'm telling you, today is the day of salvation. Now is the time. Before that hour strikes, before that door of mercy is shut, and there cannot be any more time except judgment. And let me tell you, you don't have to wait for that hour because death is another door that shuts on your face. Your death will shut the opportunity for you to get right with God. If you happen to catch coronavirus and you drop dead and you didn't make right with God, you are going straight to the lake of fire and the lake of fire is very real. It is very real. I say to people, if you don't believe, go and see the volcanoes. The fire is coming out from under the earth. Where do things coming from? God said there's fire in the lower parts of the earth. That's where hell is. Fire is coming out of the earth. And volcanoes show that there is fire under the earth. Hell is very real. And those who refuse to fear God, those who refuse to hand over their lives to God, they will have to face that lake of fire one day because they will face the judge. They will face the judge where the, the blood of Jesus can no longer cover them because they rejected it. That's why the Bible says those who reject are already condemned. When you reject Jesus, you are already condemned. Isaiah 55 verse 11, Isaiah 55 verse 11, my word which comes from my mouth is like the rain and snow. It will not come back to me without results. It will accomplish whatever I want and, and, and achieve whatever I send it to achieve. Why is it now the word of God is not accomplishing anything? in our generation. You know why? Because it is not the word of God that we are preaching. It is our words. We are preaching our ideas. We are preaching our desires. We are preaching the, the way we want things to work. We are preaching the way we understand. We are trying to remold God and make the God that is suitable to our generation. That's why some people say, if you preach like that, your church will be empty. This generation, they don't need that. I tell you, that is the lie from the pits of hell. The same gospel that saved Paul and Silas is the same gospel that we need to preach today to our young people. That's why they are confused. That's why they refuse to save God because it is his word that came out of his mouth that will accomplish. It is not your word. It is not your desire. It is not your revelation. It is not your wise things that you put together. It is not your programs or your agendas that are bringing. Your programs and your agendas, they bring multitudes, but these multitudes are coming for a social. It's a social gathering. They are not coming for the kingdom of God. They are coming for a social gathering. You preach the kingdom, you preach sin, you preach repentance, and they will disperse because that's not what they want to hear. The Bible says in the end time, they shall gather to heap themselves with those preachers who are going to tell them what their ears are itching to hear because the rebellious nature of human beings is that we do not want to be challenged. We do not want to hear the truth. But when somebody comes with a lie, we, are re we readily substitute the truth for a lie. 
Oh, church, I tell you, there's death in the pot. There's death in the pot because we are mixing the word with the will of men, with the desires of men, with men's own ideas and men's own revelation. And the word is doing absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing to the world. It's not producing. It's not producing. Let us go back to the old time religion. Let us preach the gospel as it is without, without trying to put trimmings on it. Let us preach the gospel as it is without spicing it. Let the word of God do for itself what God meant for it to do. We do not have to try to save people. All we are called is to te teach them. All we are called to do is to preach the gospel the way Jesus preached the gospel. The Holy Spirit and the Word will break the hardest of hearts. It will cause people to come back into repentance. It will cause people to line up with the things of God. It's only by the will of God that the world will be saved. It's not by might nor by power. It's not by human cleverness. It is not by the programs that we we put yes they draw crowds but those crowds are not saved those crowds are just social gatherings we need to preach the truth we need to pursue God we need to pursue the fear of God so that we have the wisdom of God time is running out time is running out I want to also challenge you as a child of God you know Jesus said on the day of judgment he will look at the he will separate the sheep from the goats and he will say to the goats depart from me you workers of iniquity i never knew you and listen to what they say oh lord but we 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 heal the sick in your name we raise the dead in your name we cast out devils in your name we preach the gospel in your name but he stands and he says i never knew you Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. How could they have been workers of iniquity when they were doing things in the name of Jesus? People use the name Jesus as a rubber stamp for what they are doing. They do their own thing and they add Jesus to it. They sing their own worldly songs and they add Jesus, Jesus to the songs. And we come and we dance Jesus, Jesus. But the song has nothing to do with Jesus. It's just a rubber stamp to fool you, to deceive you, so that you think that as long as they are using the name Jesus, they are of God. But you see, Jesus is the spirit of truth. And the spirit of truth will, will expose the lies on that day and he will say depart from me you workers of iniquity you used my name in vain you used my name to wrap a stamp your evil activities you know no one is going to get away with it but I I cry for those who would have been deceived for those who are going to find themselves in hell because they refuse to read the Bible they chose to listen to the ideas of a human being you know many Christians Christians read Christian books, but they don't read the Bible. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? You find Christians, they will tell you the hundreds of books they have read, but they never ever read the Bible. Let me tell you something. Yes, I'm not knocking down books because I also write books, but what I'm telling you is reading those books without first knowing the truth is going to lead you into error because you do not have the wisdom of God. You do not have discernment. How do you know what the book says is lining up with with scripture because the word of God is the measuring rod it is the measuring rod when you read a book it must line up with what the word of God says when somebody speaks revelation it's line up with what the word of God says and if it doesn't line up you know that it's not of God but because you the devil makes sure you don't read the Bible he doesn't mind you reading all the books that are in the world you can even become so proud that you know all the the Christian writers you know all of them you've read all their books but if you have not read the only book which the Holy Ghost himself wrote you are deceived you are deceived you are deceived I thank God when I got born again the first book I ever read was the Bible I read it from Genesis to Revelation 
over and over and over before I could read other people's books. And when I read people's books, I could see error because I knew what the word of God says. I could see error because I know what the word of God says. When I listen to someone preaching, I can detect error because I know what the scriptures say. I want to challenge every one of you who are listening to me. Read the Bible. It is not too late. Read both the Old and the New Testament because the Old Testament will show you who God is and how God deals with men. He will put the fear of God into your spirit so that you have a perspective of who God is. And then the New Testament will show you how to live and walk under the spirit of grace, how to honor that spirit of grace. You need to read both the new, the old and the new. Don't say we are no longer under the old covenant. That's a lie of the devil. Jesus didn't come to do away with the old covenant. He came to fulfill it. He came to fulfill it. So how can you know what was, it, what was fulfilled by Christ if you didn't read the Old T Testament? You see, church, we got to do away with the spirit of laziness because the spirit of laziness is the one that causes us not to read. I mean, nowadays, what excuse do you have? You can have the Bible on your phone. You can have it on your iPad. You can have it on your computer. You can have it on your laptop. You can have it anywhere. So you have no reason why you cannot read the Bible. And the very reason why we do Bible study is to give you enough appetite so that after the session is over, you can go and read the scriptures. And then instead of just reading one, verse you find yourself reading that whole chapter and the one next to it it gives you the appetite for the word of god it gives you the appetite for the word of god we need to do this our lives depend on it your soul depend on it your eternity depend on it so read the bible don't depend on what other people tell you find out the word you know the holy spirit is the teacher he is always waiting the minute you turn into the scripture the holy spirit is there to show you what you need to know the same way the, the, the eunuch from Ethiopia, alone in the desert, he opens the Bible. He doesn't know what it means. He doesn't understand. And he's asking, who is the prophet talking about? And God sends a man all the way to come and sit with him and explain to him. Now he doesn't have to do that. The Holy Spirit is with you all every day. When you open your Bible, the Holy Spirit will begin to whisper to you. He will begin to highlight light things in the word of God. Fall in love with the word of God. Fall in love with the word of God. You know, in closing, I just want to emphasize, just to remind you, listen to what John says. It's amazing. John is talking to the bodies, talking to the church. He's addressing the fathers, the children. He's addressing everyone. What is he saying? First John chapter 2, verse 13 and 14. First John chapter 2, verse 13 and 14, John says, I write unto you fathers, because you have known him. That is from the beginning. Wow. You have known him. That is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. That means young men, who are not living in sin, who are not walking in sin in the lust of the flesh, young men who are pure, who are holy, who are clean, young men and women who are clean, who are holy. That's what it means. They have overcome the wicked one. They have not allowed the world to suck them into the world. They remain pure. They remain separated unto the Lord. I write unto you, little children, he is not leaving the little ones out. I'm writing to you, little children, because you have known the Father. Even the little children must know the Father. I write to you, little children, because you have known the Father. And look how important this is. He repeats himself in verse 14. I have written unto you, fathers, because you have known him. That is from the beginning. 
I have written unto you, young men, because you are strong. You are strong. And the word of God abideth in you. Can that be said about you? You are strong and the word of God abides in you. Can you fulfill that? Can that scripture be for you? The word of God abideth in you and you have overcome the wicked one. How have they overcome the wicked one? Because the word of God abides in them. The word of God abides in them. So the only way you are ever going to overcome the wicked one is when the word of God abides in you. When you go to John chapter 15, that whole chapter, if you abide in me, I am the vine, Jesus said, and you are the branches. If you abide in me and my word abide in you, you see, the word of God must abide in you. How is the word going to abide in you if you never read it? You see, when you read the word, you fill yourself up with the word of God. The word is abiding in you. At the right hour, at the right moment, God will take from your spirit the word that you need and turn it into your rhema for the season. The reason why many Christians have never heard God speak to them is because they have no word in them. Now you got your reply. Maybe you've been going and line up Sunday after Sunday. Pastor, pray for me. I want to, to hear from God. I want God to speak to me. Pray for me. I want God to speak to me. Pray for me. I want to receive the Holy Spirit. And nothing has been happening to you. Then you know that the word of God is not abiding in you. Begin to read, begin to pray, begin to develop a relationship with the Lord. When you fill yourself with the word, you'll never run out of a rhema because the Holy Spirit takes what is inside, what you have invested inside of you. He will pick it up and put it and, and, and bring it to your remembrance. At the moment when you need that word, it will come up from within. It will come out from within, out of the abundance of the, the heart, the mouth will speak. But when you do not have the word, there is nothing inside. There is nothing for the Holy Spirit to use. People, we need to get into the word. We need to get into the word. We need to get into the word. I am just challenging all of us. Let us get into the word. He says, because you are strong and the word of God abideth in you and you have overcome the wicked one there is your secret for overcoming and remember he is coming for a bride that has overcome he is coming for a bride without spot and without wrinkle he is coming for a bride who has made herself ready so you want to be an overcomer then Get the word into your spirit. Fill yourself with the word of God. Then you are going to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. I hope that this word has fired you up like it's firing me up. I hope it has challenged you like it's challenging me right now. And I hope you're going to go away from here and get into the Bible and read the Bible. Stop hunting on YouTube. Let me warn you, there are good things on YouTube, but there are also very dangerous things. YouTube is a landmine. It's like a, a minefield, sorry, full of landmines. You are going to get the wrong people saying all the things that sound nice and sugar-coated. You lick them, they taste so good, but after you eat them, then you realize there's poison in the pot. You become sick, you become spiritually unwell because of what you eat. Read the Bible, eat the word. It is the word of God that is life. The word of God is life. Jesus said, I am the bread of life and the bread is the word and the word is Christ. When you partake of the word, you are eating life for yourself. But if you go and you want to dig, you spend all your time listening to video clips on YouTube and never reading the Bible. It's a disaster, a recipe for disaster. Hallelujah. It's a recipe for disaster. 
Put the Bible first before any other material. Put the Bible first before any other material. Every other material is secondary to the word of God. When you have the word of God, you become a wise-hearted person. You have a discerning heart. Why, where do you get the discerning heart? Because the truth shall make you free. That truth will identify the lie. That truth will always expose lies. And that's where your protection will come from. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Let us pray. Father in heaven, in the mighty name of Jesus, we want to thank you, my God, for your word that has gone out tonight. It will not return void. It will accomplish, Father, what you are sending it to accomplish in the hearts of those who are ready, in the hearts of those who are willing. Father, I pray that they will be challenged to God, that, Father, they will buy Bibles, they will read Bibles, they will mark their Bible, they will allow the word to speak into their lives. And, Father, I pray that the wisdom of God will 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 lead them into the fear the fear of God will lead them into the wisdom of God and father that we may walk in the ways that are pleasing to you and walk as wise people who are discerning the time who understand that the season and the times father you say the sons of Issachar they were wise they discerned the time they discerned the seasons father we are praying cause us my God to descend the season that we are in right now cause us to, to descend the times that we are living in right now and father we speak the blood of Jesus over your, your children the believers father we speak the blood for their protection mighty God we apply the blood upon their homes Lord upon their children their families Lord when the spirit of death which is coronavirus comes let it pass over where the blood of Jesus is applied let it pass over where the blood of Jesus is applied. For Father, you say it, you will put none of their diseases upon us, Lord. And Father, we stand on that word that you are our protection, that you hide us under the shadow of your wings. Though a thousand fall on one side, ten thousand on the other side, we shall remain standing because we have made you the Lord, our refuge and our fortress. Mighty God, we just glorify and magnify your name. We are grateful, my God to be living at such times like this in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. May the Lord bless you and bless you. May he cover you with his wings. May he protect you in the workplace, in the marketplace, in the streets, in your homes. May the name of the Lord Jehovah God be your protection in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and good night. We'll meet again next Monday. God be with you.